digital communications can still create community, replicating it, as you said, Jeff, right? Like even though it's on a screen, you can still connect, but it's the depth of the connection and how are employers actually gonna tie that depth of connection community yeah. to their employer value proposition. Okay, so I've teed it up. Um, I'll just remind you guys that we talked a little bit about the, uh, the background, I'll give you the background. And we talked about how remote to hybrid work is now becoming ingrained in both business strategies and how we personally experience work. As we consider how these things work together, what are some of the unique approaches that you might have seen uh, or heard about? And also, the second question might be, and you can answer either one of these, how do we get the balance right? Or maybe, is that even the right question? Mm. You know, uh, between uh, the decentralization and the centralization of work. Mm. Let's open it up. Who'd like to go first? Who's that brave soul? Mark was in before, so Lisa I'll, now. I'll start yeah. with this may not answer either of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> we'll embrace it. I think this whole notion of in the office, out of the office, remote, not remote, what we have to get back to is our workers are adults. Yes. We should not be telling them what to do. We should be consulting with them, mm -hmm. explaining the business needs. Here's why we need a critical mass in the office for certain activities. Here's what we're concerned about if you work from home. And then we need to listen to them and what their situation is. And what, what I see that really distresses me and disappoints me is that we get into the work environment, we have all this rhetoric about employee engagement and people operating at the top of their licenses and loyalty to the company, and then we treat them like set of graders. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. We have to treat them like adults and realize that they're spending 80% of their waking hours working for us, empowering them to choose some aspects of how they do what they do mm -hmm. will garner us more productivity, more rewards, more loyalty, more engagement than anything else we can do. And I, I get so distressed when I see some of these CEOs, particularly the big banks, say everyone's got to be back in five right. days a week without even attempting to provide a rationale. Well, the rationale is real estate. Yeah. The rationale may be real estate, yeah. but it's 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 not treating <laughs> the employees as partners and really not recognizing the value of all the people who are making the magic happen in the right. workplace mm. every day. Amen. I'd say also the rationale is not only real estate, but it's fear. It's fear of some leaders that they're losing control of their assets, mm -hmm. the people like we talked yeah. about at the outset. And I mean, I think we found that flexibility is the new currency. Mm -hmm. it, we did a lot of research to try to figure out when we were trying to influence our approach to kind of the new working relationship to understand what does flexibility translate to in the way of like, would you accept less money if we would allow you more workplace flexibility? And the number we came up with is 10%, which is not, we wouldn't be able to root too much in that, but yeah, flexibility is key. And to Lisa's great point, I think it's a lot about having the conversation with each individual because it's an individual conversation. I think during COVID, my family included, we all figured out we all have something going on and some of us saw it in the backgrounds uh, or we heard about it when we opened up and shared and we're more vulnerable um, and flexibility helps manage what we have going on. And to an earlier point in a different conversation, it's putting human back in the workplace. Yeah. How do you build team? Right. I think it's so important now with hybrid and remote is how do you build team as a leader, right? So before it was, you got a salary and you're coming to this physical location. So you're gonna interact with these certain human beings. And just by that, there's a bond that's created and you identify in that way. And you're like, it's hard to separate yourself, right? And I think now it's, yeah, we're almost like a video game. Work is like a video game. You turn on the screen, you do it for X amount of time and then I'm done and I'm back to reality with my family. And I think it's really important to figure out how to create moments, even in Zoom, where you're just talking about what's going on in your life. 
I'm yes. not here to get productivity out of you in the, in the normal sense. I want to learn about you. I want to build camaraderie. And so that as because if just drawing back on growing up and playing sports and, and having a team, when you care about each other, and I'm not saying we're going to get to the utopia of family, but at least we care about the fact that, okay, you have this going on tomorrow. I'll step in and I'll help you out with your workload. And that type of kind of lifting each other up it builds that camaraderie where it's stickiness to the employer. I think employers are concerned about, they don't care about my company. They're doing a job and they're really good. I don't want them to leave, but they don't care because yeah. as long as they can turn on the screen and get access to their employer and get a paycheck, they care about where they are with their family much more now than ever before. And so if we can kind of help the fear of the employer of how do we build team and stickiness to the employee and the employer through the screen, I think the hybrid and remote won't be as scary. Yeah, so building a team is critical for you and doing it via a screen is gonna be different, but it still hits at the elements of the things that people care about. Like, mm-hmm. hey, do you actually care about me? And do I care about you? Yeah. And you can do that through a screen. It's not the same as like, you know, us getting together in this physical location, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you can still do it to some extent. Right. Amanda, you had a comment, and then for you, Tony. Don't let me forget, uh, Amanda, then Tony. I'm really bad. <laughs> <laughs> we'll help you, Tony. We'll help you. I'll remember Tony. I'll pass it over to you. <laughs> yeah, I was just, like, so what I, so far, what we've heard, right, like two very large areas of development underway. And it's the employee, employer's culture, yeah. right? And how do we re- redefine that? And it's going to be individual for every organization. But it's going to require how do we connect community? How do we make sure that our newer generations of employees who are digital natives, Mm -hmm. right, develop a sense of retention and want to stay with their employees? So community is actually going to be redefined, right? Because some of our employees do find that digital communications can still create community, replicating it, as you said, Jeff, right? Like even though it's on a screen, you can still connect, but it's the depth of the connection and how are employers actually going to tie that depth of connection and community yeah. to their employer value proposition, right? That's going to create the culture. The last thing I'll say about the economic point is that Matthew Kahn talks a lot about this in Going Remote. It's about the local economy of real estate and also adjacent, I'll just call real estate adjacent, right? Economic impact is not going away. We have to really think about what is being left behind in a permanence of hybrid remote work and what will happen to those spaces, those businesses Mm. that closed down post pandemic, didn't come back and how are we actually going to revitalize right in a different way, right? Those local economies of scale. Mm. And one thing I would offer up for us to consider is how about recreating in these small economic areas, residential spaces and places. Yeah. And so recently we, we learned that post 9-11 that happened in New York City, right? Where they redefined what residences look like in a space where no businesses wanted to exist anymore, mm-hmm. right? That's a real area of improvement and innovation for us. And $46 billion is sitting at the White House now yeah. to help us do that. That's so let's rethink, it. let's rethink that. This podcast is brought to you by Paradox AI, also known as Olivia, recruiting's most advanced AI assistant. I use Paradox at my previous organization, and their team helped us create a candidate concierge experience that ensured a fast hiring process that still felt very human. We literally hired hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom were critical healthcare workers needed during the pandemic. It's not just me. Organizations like McDonald's, General Motors, Unilever, and L'Oreal use this technology to create engaging and fast candidate experiences. Go to Paradox.ai to learn more about the amazing things Paradox and Olivia can do for you. Just a few months ago, I was with the Skills for Chicago Lands feature at the, at the National Expansion Board meeting, yeah. and we went out to chat on uh, Illinois, with the channel part of Chicago land, where Discover had, like a alien, plopped 
a, uh, a, uh, a customer call center right in the middle of one of the highest unemployment, highest crime areas in the area. And, and you know what they, why they put it there? Because they said people actually wanted work, but it would take them literally a one hour commute mm -hmm. to get to any reasonable, decent paying job. Mm -hmm. right. So by plopping that call center right in the middle of Chatham, you know, mm -hmm. the Chatham district, they have an opportunity and now their numbers are off the charts. Mm -hmm. They're, that is the number one call center for all of Discover Heart. They have, uh, they have retention rates through the roof. They have quality parts. Now they recognize they had a scaling up issue. Mm -hmm. Like they were entering a community who, who might be were first generation, right? Myself included, like first generation professionals in corporate America. But like, hey, all of a sudden, we're gonna skill these people off and we're gonna invest in them. And oh, by the way, we're gonna create community areas within the within the sector to allow people within the community to use the corporate offices for you know for their benefit mm -hmm. so that that would in turn give back mm -hmm. i think that what you're saying is like decentralization isn't around around a choice around i think you put you put it it's not centralization decentralization it's around meeting the needs of mm -hmm. the people so that they can actually do the things that they are good at and be able to do it in a place that they they are most effective at. Mm -hmm. I think about during COVID, how many people on my team actually struggled with the childcare issue? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Right? Oh, yeah, hey, how many people saw the CNN person that you know, was lucky enough to have a nanny to be able to pull his kids out of that situation, but he's literally on live television. You know, with the nanny pulling it out of the this, this yeah. mm -hmm. I don't know. I've never had a nanny, right? Yeah, maybe some of you guys have. I don't know. I don't judge one way or another, but I don't think I've ever, you know. The fact is, we are not, most of these individuals that we're talking about are needing to provide child care. They're providing elder care. They're providing care for their others within that. And they're trying to provide a living or their, their, and I love the example that you said, said this decentralization of work isn't necessarily about a form of choice. Mm -hmm. It's about rethinking the whole problem itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from the beginning, so very good. I didn't want to forget to Tony, yeah. Amanda, <laughs> Amanda, this is exactly <laughs> why I asked for your help. Thank you. <laughs> Tony, over oh, to you. Oh, I, I like the, you know, the tension of meeting the needs of the people, meeting the needs of the company, I think is very real. So. Uh, during the pandemic, I actually launched a new business, and it was almost a clean slate experiment, right? Totally new industry, something my old company wasn't in. And I'd say, first off, the ability to hire remote is the only reason we could even get in, right? Um, historically, the concentration of talent was in North Carolina, New York, New Jersey was not, Rhode Island was not in, uh, in the Northeast in the same way. And so, first off, without the ability to go decentral or to go hybrid, we fundamentally couldn't even launch the business and attract the right level of talent. Mm -hmm. And the talent that we're able to get, you know, a few of my team members became CEOs out of the work that they did and more to come because the, the caliber of people we were able to get to attack this new problem was incredible. What we found really quickly though is remote only did fundamentally not work. We weren't able to move at the speed we needed. Um, and there was a whole host of reasons that we sort of stepped back and really started to study, right? What's the culture that we built? You know, how did we make that personal connection with individuals? How do we really make that feel more real? So the first slide was really trying to step back and be deliberate about how to create those opportunities, whether it's social events and virtual happy hours or the yeah. Zoom bingo, you guys all remember that stuff. But it really <laughs> matters for folks to say like, and get to know each other. I learned, you know, one of my teammates, you know, used to get nanny by Howard Stern, actually, right? Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, another guy just bought a job as a factor, right? And these became really, you know, um, we joked about them, but really powerful anecdotes. Another guy was a waiter at 99 before he went into healthcare. Yeah. Met his wife there. And the ability to have those connections was powerful. I will say, though, they were insufficient. And so that next level of struggle was there was really, we're solving really complex operational uh, challenges, right? That the Zoom environment or the virtual only were just not conducive, right? 
And so the balance we really have to strike is we needed people back in. And the question was, is it a forced one day, two day, three day a week? Or is it ultimately how do you create opportunities and get creative, right? Well, there's our leadership team. We started meeting once a month in different geos and we would allow people to come in and visit with us, right? And we started to build these opportunities for us to get together, for teams to get together, and for folks in those communities to get together. I'll tell you the productivity improvements that we mm. saw, you know, we sort of raced a few extra months ahead just after the first few times we did this um, in a lot of our product roadmap because folks had the ability to get together, build relationships, build trust. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, the same way we're in this room together, it's more powerful. Mm -hmm. Those moments were fundamentally more powerful. And so I think this, this real tension of how do you meet the needs of the person and, and create that level of connectivity and choice but fundamentally, that's, that's sometimes going to run into conflict with the needs to deliver a certain kind of an outcome. And I yeah. think that's a very real tension we'll all have to continue to kind of live with. So what I heard you say was really, I think, really powerful was that there's a, a downside to the remote, but then we need to get creative as to finding the value and how we leverage remote to create value, but also how we leverage in person to create a special value whenever we do do the in-person. And that's where the important key. It's credible when you, when you have a specific problem and you're reacting and changing based on, not because you just want everybody back in the office, but because there's a specific business yes. need that people can see, they're feeling that you can explain. I think part of what it calls out is how do we equip our frontline leaders to have these conversations and mm -hmm. to work through these discussions? Because we have adults, they're mature enough to have these conversations. We can see we're not meeting a business need or we are meeting a business need so we can be more flexible. Um, I think we need to make sure we train leaders to be able to do it because I don't think everyone's ready. Mm -hmm. I mean, if our CEOs aren't ready, maybe our frontline leaders are more ready than CEOs in some cases, but I think everybody needs some support with it. Ron? Yeah, picking up a little bit more on what Tony was saying, in our organization during COVID, we found ourselves pivoting quite well to working remotely. Um, and what we got done best was the work within our respective businesses. So whether it was marketing or HR or uh, uh, the revenue generating business line, we, we had our best results we had had in years. But what didn't go well was cross functional work and projects, whether they were system implementations that required some people from each area, just were really long delayed. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until kind of after we started to come back that we realized that was our deficit, that we really, we just missed on catching people as we used to, and our focus was off. Mm -hmm. uh, and we needed to bring it back into calibration. Mm -hmm. that's awesome. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a great point. And I would just add to that to say, you know, uh, companies have made it through uh, COVID and they and it's like, well, listen, if we made it through those two years, we were 100 percent remote. Why can't we continue to be that? I think the question comes down to is make it through good enough mm -hmm. or like what are we missing on the innovation and the upside and the growth of the company? And I for us. It was that uh, innovation and uh, collaboration piece that was missing. And while we had great years during COVID, we knew that wasn't the long-term, you know, proposition for the company. So I also think, you know, Jeff, you asked what the uh, innovative ideas are around this. I'm not sure there's a lot of innovative ideas. I think there's more practical ideas. Everything I'm hearing on the table is more practical, pragmatic, effective ideas that work for not only the company's agenda but for the employee. And um, just as an example, I think the whole concept of a company saying, we want you back in the office two days a week, pick your days. Mm. To me, that's saying, we really don't know why we want you in the office and we're just gonna pick your days. Because let's say I need to uh, collaborate with Colin and he picks Thursday and I pick Tuesday. Mm. Um, and what you don't want is someone driving home that night after a day in the office saying, I did exactly the same thing I could do at home. Right. And so yeah. what we did is we actually uh, prescripted those days. We said it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, everybody's in together mm -hmm. and everybody is remote together, right? That only works if you change your schedules. 
You have to put the meetings that are necessary, those innovative collaboration, yep. staff meetings, the ones that connect people and bond them to the company. If you don't do that and you just don't change your schedule, you just have people all in, then people are gonna drive home saying, I did the same thing that I could have at home. Yeah. That's a great point. So this is a big struggle for me. Um, and I've modernized my thinking. We've done all the things people have talked about. We have a hybrid <clears throat> workforce. We hire nationally to get the best athletes. We create a level of flexibility and we're very deliberate. We have one week of the month where our senior leaders come in together and we're very deliberate about scheduling our town halls, our strategy sessions, et cetera. But the struggle for me, and I think overall, employee engagement is good. We've heard good feedback around this. This is very different than the previous leadership and what they did. But I walk away from, we call it in week. I walk away from in week, or fly away from in week, and I'm like, that was the best week. Mm. And so the having in person interaction, <laughs> and everyone says it, like that was a great week. And so we're gonna keep this the way it is for now, but I do really mm. think that that in person, mm -hmm. if you make it valuable and meaningful, everything with social interactions yeah. to strategic sessions is invaluable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I struggle with that as a leader. No, I love that. and I. I mean, I'm hearing too this theme of intentionality and, and purpose. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that gets to the kind of respect for the people that we kind of talked about, right? Not knowing that they're a great example, right? Doesn't matter. But planning and really building workflow and team and engagement around that, I think, is the ultimate sign of respect for employees. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. When people get together, there's almost like an euphoria of like yeah. being able to connect and, and solve problems and, and getting that high from it. But without that level of intentionality and, and purpose is where I, I think you really start to fail, you know, a lot of colleagues. And well, to Keith's point, there's enough literature and research out there now that you can actually, they have identified, like new hires, mm -hmm. like they've identified that as you want an in-person interaction yeah. for right. a new hire. Right. Strategic session or the group thing, yeah. right? Of the, you know, the, the, you know, the horizontal mm -hmm. way of thinking, they've identified that as the most effective way has to be something out of person. So yeah. you know, equipping our manage our leaders with that information so that they can be intentional, I think is very important. Mm -hmm. The other thing I just want to say, I want to bring up again, this is the white collar professional workforce. Mm -hmm. And it is ironic and I think sad that the people who probably are the most burdened by going into work in terms of cost, time, Yes. Lack of support for childcare, lack of support for illness, <laughs> all those things are more likely to be the ones who have to go into work mm -hmm. that don't have the option. And we can't forget about mm -hmm. them in this new world order. Mm -hmm. I don't have the answer, I wish I did, mm -hmm. but I remember when COVID first started and we go to all these like CHRO wizard get togethers. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not people are like, like, what are we going to do about the people who are working from home? And I'm like, I have 210,000 people who are going into the workplace every day, who aren't feeling safe, who are feeling very unsupported by the company because they're out in public. And this was at the time where yeah. we all thought you could get COVID from touching a doorknob and this kind of thing. I'm worried about those people. I'm not so worried about the people who are safe at home in their dining rooms. I get they have issues, but they're feeling safe. Right. So I would just like to say, yeah. as we evolve all this, we have to remember the people who don't have a choice. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. yeah I, I was thinking about that, because, uh, and that's a great point, Lisa, is that uh, I think of a guy from my church, and he, uh, his name's Carl, and he could barely get in, and he has a walker, right? comes in every day, but he look, works at Walmart. He looks forward to be able to talk to them, all of his, that's actually his life, mm -hmm. is looking forward to talk to every single customer. I hear about it because he actually helps me because I'm the head usher and I'm responsible for the offering. <laughs> so he actually helps validate with me that we take an offering and I put it away and then I lock it up. I hear about almost every single customer that he has through that entire time. <laughs> he talks about the little kids and, and the jokes he plays on them and the and the funny little stories that he tells them. But it's 
But it's those people that I think, to your point, we need to be worried thoughtful of to not, say not what does it mean for enjoy it as much as Carl now <laughs> love it like Carl because some of them think that they have more potential than Carl so uh but like Carl though all those folks that are meeting the customer every day face to face need to be there five plus days a week to uh Lisa's point how do we we, we can't make them hybrid no right but how do we make their their lives easier and more like how do you address the the daycare? How do you address the transportation? How do you address some things that that make them feel valued that they have to go in? They can't be hybrid because that's not the business model. But how do you make that trip and that experience easier for them? Yes. You know? Yeah. So, how do you meet them halfway? So, sure. No, I you know. I think it's really personal. And I think Lisa's point is well taken. Like yeah. we have to think about, so I have call center people. I yes. thought the best thing in the world, they were all coming into the corporate. I thought the best thing in the world was going to be, let them work remotely. Well, 50% of them love it. And 50% of them don't love it. And so it's very personal. And so I think we have to create options and we have to think about it differently depending mm -hmm. on the level of person. Mm -hmm. But um, and to your point, Mark, like I, you know, mine was an all or none. Um, now I have a problem with the 50% that are, don't like it and are underproducing and what do I do with them? But I think it's how do you get creative and try to meet them where, you know, kind of in the middle because that's really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. it, it, it gets to that mass customization that we're actually used to in some respects in this new you know, consumerized world where we can you know order on Amazon and get whatever you know perfect or go to Indochino and have 75 measurements taken on our body to have the perfect bespoke suit, right? So, and, and do it for three, four hundred dollars, right? As opposed to like you know thousands of dollars, which we used to give, you know, have to pay for. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. It's like saying, okay, now I have a problem. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that you're very, but I have a problem now because I thought that I was doing the right thing because we did something for the 50% that really needed us to do it. But now there's 50%. There's no perfect solution mm -hmm. to any of this. And that's, and I love the transparency of that, Sharon, is that, that even in the best intended actions, we ultimately don't have a perfect solution for all people. Mm -hmm. That's really awesome. Amanda? No, you know, I was just going to add that I think for the employees who have limited options, because we need them to be productive on site by nature of their role, I think there's a lot of intentionality and purpose that has to come into the fabric of autonomy. I mean, that's where I, we have found that evolving hybrid work to redefine to be flexible work allowed our employees who didn't have that choice, um, it allowed them the autonomy that they were really craving, but they didn't know how to articulate it, right? So if we just change schedules, but it does of course require resources, right? Of enough people that allow them to flex their job, take care of childcare, take care of other responsibilities. I don't want to um, slight on elder care, which is a yeah. huge yeah. issue, yeah. right? I mean, there are a lot of responsibilities that our employees are dealing with. Regardless, we just don't know what they are. The customization of those responsibilities, I think, hinges on how flexible our employer is going to be that allows for some autonomy in their schedule. If I could flex my job third shift by two hours because it allows me to avoid the cost of child care, elder care, pet care, whatever it may be, that's a huge value add. And so that's when they begin to perceive, as the feedback has shown us in the data, you know, that's when they begin to see that, oh, my employer is paying attention, right? Those two hours made a difference for me. My supervisor's loosening the reins a little bit. Mm -hmm. I could still get my job done. And guess what? I now save, you know, about $500 a year, avoiding the cost, right, of having to be there at home or pay someone else to, to in lieu of the care that I could provide. So one of the things I did pick up on, though, is I have a number of healthcare clients now mm -hmm. as part of my consulting business. And one of the things we do is uh, with the nursing space. 
but we're actually talking about yeah. traditionally nursing nursing hours have been twelve hour shifts right. right into the hospitals. Right. They talk about breaking them down to as little as four hours mm-hmm. to create space to allow to exactly to your point to create that customization mm-hmm. because flexibility is the primary driver in decision making whether you want to join an organization uh, in this case a health system as to whether it be a nurse I mean, so i'll just i'll throw in this other perspective too so for highly matrixed global companies uh like the one that i'm a part of i think one of the benefits that we're hearing is that the virtual um, supports career road mapping um, and creates access to the most senior leaders that they normally would not have had, right? Because while folks are located across, um, mm-hmm. you know, our national footprint right. and our senior leaders might be in hubs outside of those markets, um, individual contributors or even, you know, people leaders would you know, interact with their teams and normally just have direct line of sight to their folks. But now with this open source access and having the opportunity to engage with senior leaders and have visibility into other work streams, it has sparked curiosity in terms of, I never had access to what my colleagues on that end of the business do because their function wasn't located here and I didn't have access to that. So I would just offer that for for us and for more highly matrixed companies, a benefit of that virtual has been reimagining career road mapping because of the access to conversations and information and also how senior leaders have, those that are mindful of it, have been a lot more intentional about creating more personal experiences right. with frontline um, uh, contributors and talent that normally would never have imagined themselves having conversations with those senior leaders, which supports retention and right. cultivates a culture, again, if it's supported right, um, that perhaps wouldn't have existed in these more sophisticated and highly matrix orgs. Creates an egalitarian, you know, opportunity for people to be able to have access to leaders that they wouldn't have had access right. to before, mm-hmm. which creates opportunity for them to get promotion and recognition. Correct. Uh, but also, it, it allows them to fly close to the sun too. And if they uh, if they don't do so well, it might be to create opportunities for them to not do as well, and those, mm-hmm. which then it creates learning opportunities for them to grow from. Yeah, or hopefully. So this has been a wonderful discussion. I am very humbled by the fact that all of you have come to my uh, little uh, shindig here. Uh, growing your business with people, inaugural, in person, podcast party, <laughs> slash holiday <laughs> event. So uh, give a round of applause.